so now from distributed computing to um, uh, for learning to learning at an individual synapse, uh, we have uh, very happy to have Mu Ming Pu uh, from the Chinese Academy of Sciences who's going to talk about synaptic plasticity and brain-inspired uh, machine learning. Come on up. How do I reset this? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, a great pleasure. This, this to will be go here. yellow at 25 and red at 30. Oh. So I'm going to talk about biology, and hopefully uh, you will learn something. For those in the machine learning field, uh, learn a little bit about biology that might help. Um, so synaptic plasticity is the topic. Okay, so uh, um, I'll do shadow puppets for a minute or two to entertain you while, while we get this sorted out. Let's reset this. Okay, we good to go? Good. So, um, well, um, neuroplasticity, synaptic plasticity is the basis of most cognitive function. Now we know how the plasticity comes about. Activity in the brain, associated with sensory, motor, cognitive experience, create changes in the neurons and synapse. That's uh, the modification of neuron synapse is the plasticity. Once this neuron has changed, then uh, we have a new state, uh, the learning and, and memory has occurred and there are changes uh, cognitive behavior. So the key question in the field is how does the activity modify the synapse, modify the neuron? Uh, we heard a little bit about uh, last night about how, how activity, how neuronal uh, excitability can be modified by a variety of uh, inferences. And the synapse is also very susceptible to change. Now the, the best uh, hypothesis comes about 70 years ago, Hab's learning rule, we all heard about it. Uh, he proposed that when a neuron is keeps exciting the, uh, a downstream neuron and if two neuron activities correlated, you, get, you have a, a potentiation of the synapse. Uh, and now to understand the uh, thought, maybe this has to be, uh, can be uh, extended. If the neurons uh, pre and post synapses are not correlating their activity, for example, these cells inhibited by some other inputs, then you have uh, uncorrelated activity. The synapse could be downregulated, so you have up and down uh, uh, bidirectional modulation. Uh, that's that's very uh, very nice, complete hypothesis. So this is what we know as the cells that fire together, wire together. Now this uh, has received a very good uh, physiological confirmation with the discovery of the LTP in the 70s and LTD, long-term potentiation, in the uh, uh, 80s. Uh, now, in the, in the LTP, what you have is a high-frequency stimulation uh, at the input create a, a, a rapid increase in the synaptic uh, uh, efficacy, and that persists for a long time, the hours and days, and that's called uh, LTP. Now, when you, this is consistent with HAPS postulate when you, you have a high frequency, the postsynaptic excitation can accumulate and they fire right after the input, so you have a correlated firing. But if you have a low frequency stimulation, uh, so that occur in uh, hippocampus, in cerebellum that was first discovered, um, low frequency stimulation, the postsynaptic uh, excitation cannot accumulate, it dies off. So you have presynaptic excitation, no postsynaptic excitation, uncorrelated activity, so you get LTD. Now, uh, roughly, you can understand that this is fits with the HAPS learning rule. But this is a functional change, there's structure. The structure is very, uh, very interesting. In excitatory synapse, most of the axon terminal ends on the dendritic spines, the protrusions. These are highly dynamic structure. They actually change in shape, change in, uh, disappear and form new spines 
in a dynamic manner. So in, even in adult brain, uh, uh, five to 10% of synapse change every day. Uh, there are new, form, new, new spine form, means a new, 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 new synapse established. Now this uh, dynamics of this spine might be the uh, an important form of memory. In fact, LTP, when it's inducing slice in cell culture, is uh, always accompanied with some spine growth after the LTP within 30 minutes. So maybe structural change is actually a way of stabilizing the synaptic uh, changes caused by activity. Now, uh, the, que the question it has been, now uh, when we have long-term memory, are these long-term memories stored in the changes in the function or in the structure, whether you have formed new, new synapses, that's the way of stabilizing long-term memory. So in the field, we need to have very clear demonstration of this, and we thought uh, uh, the current uh, methods of in vivo two-photon imaging, uh, developed uh, here by uh, Wen Biao Gan uh, in NYU by Carl Sparvoda uh, in uh, Genetia Farm, uh, you can now uh, you can now uh, look at the same synapse repeatedly over days and weeks, uh, looking at the, uh, the uh, spines, dendritic spines and uh, presynaptic boutons and postsynaptic spines, see how they change uh, social learning. The question is, can we, how can you be sure that these synapses are involved in the learning and memory? Right, so uh, to do that, uh, well one, one approach would be to find a very robust learning paradigm. We know where the, the, the synaptic change has to occur and look at specific at a site, uh, whether you, have, you can discover fo uh, uh, structural change. So we found that auditory uh, field condition is certainly the, the best, uh, one of the most robust uh, learning paradigm. You pair a sound stimulus with a foot shock. After pairing, uh, only the, uh, giving the sound will cause the freezing of the mouse, uh, showing that uh, they, are, they now know what sound means after uh, pairing. Now, uh, control would be unpaired stimulus of the sound and the foot shock. You don't get this freezing response. Very robust, 90, 95% of mice after uh, the, the training would, would show this freezing response for many days. Uh, so these circuits actually very well work out by uh, Joe Ladu and their colleagues here in NYU. Uh, they have uh, chart out all the synaptic plasticity that occur in the input from cortex from the thalamus and also the uh, plasticity within the, uh, within the amygdala. Uh, the pair stimulus from the sensory stimulus and the uh, uh, foot shock and auditory uh, stimulus converge in the amygdala. Once the, the plasticity occur, the output of freezing or motor response can be generated only by giving the sensory auditory signal. So this uh, uh, circuit is uh, very much complete, but there's one, uh, one uh, connection that has not been paid much attention. That is the, the uh, connection from uh, uh, lateral amygdala to the auditory cortex. There is evidence from the Norman Weinberger's lab many years ago that auditory cortex uh, tuning property of the, uh, the auditory neuron changed after this f uh, auditory field conditioning. So maybe there's some plasticity, uh, some memory store in, in the auditory cortex. So we chose to uh, look at this region uh, in part because that's the where the two photon imaging gives the, uh, the best uh, imaging uh, uh, in these uh, superficial layers of the cortex. So this is what we did. We uh, look uh, first whether this auditory cortex is really important for storing memory. Now if you uh, bilaterally inhibit two sites, uh, out, uh, uh, the auditory co cortex with a musimal, or you uh, block the LTP with the APV, uh, the condition cannot occur. This is what you expect. Now, the auditory cortex is important for processing the uh, field conditioning uh, uh, signals. But more importantly, more interestingly, if you have the condition already created, then you block the activity. After the condition, field condition was already created, the uh, Musimos uh, inhibition or APV uh, inhibition will block the retrieval of memory. That is, after the conditioning, something's going on in the auditory cortex that the memory is stabilized. And then 
Uh, if you don't have the plasticity at that, after conditioning at that region, no activity in the auditory cortex, you don't get, uh, uh, you cannot recall the, the, uh, the, uh, the memory, the field memory. Now this, uh, this projection from the amygdala can be uh, clearly traced. It's monosynaptic projection in the auditory cortex. You can backtrace with a retro beat, uh, inject in the auditory cortex, you get, get the labeling in the uh, am natural amygdala. You can also do retro, retro, gray, uh, retro uh, pseudovirus retrograde labeling, showing that there's a monosynaptic connection from natural amygdala to the auditory cortex. So that's where I look. Now first we can look at the, whether the activity is really uh, required for retrieval. Now you can do optogenetic uh, silencing of the terminal in the auditory cortex, or use a pharmacological or, or chemogenetic methods where you can selectively uh, label the natural amygdala using uh, light or uh, perfusion drugs to inhibit the natural amygdala terminals in the auditory cortex. And if you do that, you find that recall of the memory can be blocked. The infusion of this drug will block uh, substantially the recall of memory. But if you infuse the the, you prevent the, the, this terminal activity before the condition, there's no effect. So the activity after the condition is important. Now what's going on in the auditory cortex? You can see the natural amygdala projection in the auditory cortex, the synaptic bouton, presynaptic bouton from lateral amygdala, amygdala the axons. This bouton undergoes growth. You sometimes you see new bouton appearing, sometimes the old bouton disappearing. So there's a basal dynamic turnover of the synapse as revealed by presynaptic bouton. Now, we don't, we don't have a postsynaptic spine here because we are labeling on presynaptic side. And you find that after conditioning, three days after conditioning, a substantial increase in the number of new uh, synapses, new bouton form, suggesting new synapses are made, right? Uh, the, the different inputs from uh, uh, prefrontal cortex, you don't see that, right? They're, they're sort of basically flat. Now, Look at the postsynaptic side in the, uh, in the pyramidal cells in the cortex. Layer five uh, neurons. Uh, there are dendrites in the layer, uh, layer one. Uh, have spines. These spines also show growth or, or retraction or disappearance or elimination. So they also have a basal rate, and the rate for formation is clearly increased after three days. Not right after the uh, condition, but three days later, they are mu mu uh, substantial more new synapses are formed. But the old synapse that gets eliminated, the rate is remain the same. So it's the addition of new synapses, both presynaptic side and postsynaptic side appear to be important. Now this is, you know, labeling one side is not uh, clearly enough to demonstrate this is the amygdala synapse and postsynaptic is uh, uh, really making the, 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 uh, the postsynaptic contact with the uh, pyramidal cells. So we, have, we need double labeling, and this is a bit difficult, but we finally can, can uh, accomp accomplish this by labeling presynaptic axon. You can see boutons, postsynaptic spines. You look for pairs of both presynaptic defined input and postsynaptic defined layer, uh, the five neurons. You see this uh, synapse. After three days, you will see many of the new synapses formed by an addition of a new spines on a pre-existing bouton. Or you can see many cases of a, a existing synapse with an additional bouton forming on the old spine. So there are two forms, well, adding presynaptic element on the old synapse, adding postsynaptic element on the, uh, on the postsynapse. So you create a lot of this multi-synaptic spine uh, multi-bouton spines and the multi-spine uh, bouton right, in, in the, by, at the EM, EM level. And the rate of this pair, really identified pair formation, increases with time after, after uh, in fact, uh, you look specifically at uh, uh, this uh, amygdala to cortic uh, cortical neuron spines, uh, you will see uh, even two hours after conditioning, there's a substantial increase. So now, are there new spines? We're looking for uh, entirely new synapse formation. Suggest after memory formation, maybe there's a new de novo formation of synapse. It turns out, no. There's, the, in fact, uh, uh, type 1, type 2, either adding new spine on old synapse or adding, uh, adding a new uh, bouton on the old synapse. 
uh, an old spine. These are the majority of the cases. The de novo formation of entirely new uh, connections is very rare, you know, less than 5%. So, so that suggests in the, in the mature brain, what you ha uh, the structural change is not making new connections, but a modification of existing connection by just making it more efficient, making it more complex. Right? This is how it seems to be the way that, that the mature brain is doing it. This is very different from what we know uh, in the developing circuits. When the human baby were born one month after birth, there's very little actually synapse uh, you can find. There's a lot of neurons, neurons already born with the same number uh, uh, we have in adult, but the network, the functional network are formed after the birth. Right? During first month, the first couple of months and first couple of years, there's a tremendous growth of new, new synapse, uh, large scale growth, and also large scale refinement, uh, pruning. In fact, pruning is very important. The increase in the spine number, you see after birth, you know, tremendous increase. Then you have, a, um, you have a pruning that goes, goes down, the number of the spine goes down, suggests the number of synapses are, are, are eliminated. Finally, eventually, you know, when you get an old age, you have a, a, a degeneration. I mean, ab um, ADs, you have even more severe degeneration. Abnormal sp spine pruning has been correlated with neurological diseases, uh, neuropsychiatric diseases. So pruning of uh, spine is very important during development. Large-scale rewiring is very important. Now, this is where, how the experience shaped, the, uh, shaped uh, the circuit in the brain. And there's a clear difference between a developmental and adult plasticity. Large-scale rewiring occurring in the developing brain, but uh, wiring in the adult brain is very limited. Now, you think this is a very good way that, uh, for the, uh, that the evolution has, has, has uh, created. Because in early days, before you really form a functional synapse, you want to experience really shape the circuits. But once the, shapes, uh, the circuit is shaped, which are already store all the experience in your childhood, you don't want to eliminate it. You don't want to large scale re refinement, otherwise you lose all the early learning, right? Now you still want plasticity. What you do is you use the original circuit, you add a little bit more or uh, reduce some, right? So you do limited remodeling. That's most energy efficient, and is uh, what in adult brain that's, uh, that can allow you to do, do. because uh, the adult brain, if you look at the email, it's full with cells. There's not much room for new growth, right? So uh, uh, this is how the, uh, the plasticity go, uh, uh, no, works in the adult brain. But evolution also come up with the new things. Now, if you have an injury, you want the circuit to re reform to uh, allow reco functional recovery. So there's a reactive sprouting. So once you have an injury, the, the intact axon tend to sprout, can, can increase the potential of uh, growth. Then they can form new synapses, right? So this is an unusual situation, an, an, a form of plasticity uh, developed by, uh, you know, evolved uh, to help the animal to regain their function. Now, in fact, this also points a very interesting uh, uh, point that uh, that the developmental plasticity we found in early days, uh, most typically uh, you know, demonstrated by the oculus dominance plasticity, where you deprive the input from one eye, the, the central connection would be lost. That type of plasticity can be revived, can be you know, wake up by in the adult brain. You can show developmental plasticity in an adult brain in the mice mo model uh, by a number of treat. Uh, tr uh, tricks, uh, change the EI balance, you can digest the extracellular matrix, so-called perineuronal net, that en en uh, en enclose the, uh, the synapse, uh, around the synapse, and, and removal of uh, extracellular matrix proteins and, and uh, extracellular factors. You can re uh, no, re uh, 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 revive, reactivate it, uh, the developmental synapse. This is very Im important for functional recovery, uh, potential uh, a clinical recovery of circuits. Now, now when we look at uh, early development, uh, we, we mentioned the, the uh, um, plasticity. Um, we, uh, in development case, there's a, a great refinement. One of the best cases uh, for studying this, you look at refinement of the synapse. 
uh, from the early retinal tactile synapses, hi highly diffuse, even though there's a gradient, but activity would reshape them into more refined point-to-point -point topography, totally point connections. And this, by looking at this, uh, this refinement process, we found that the HAPS learning rule is not quite uh, exact. Now, for example, HAP saying that HAP was saying that correlated activity gives you LTP, uncorrelated activity gives you LTD. But we found that uncorrelated activity can also gives you a uh, correlated activity can also give you LTD if the uh, if synaptic input comes after the spike. Now, if the synaptic input uh, uh, comes before the spikes of the tactile neuron, uh, the the uh, the central neuron you have a LTP, but if it comes late after the cell post-synaptic cell have spiked, you have LTD. So the same correlation in terms of 10 millisecond difference, but you have a spike time independent uh, modification. So this is, uh, fits with the, idea, the finding by Henry Markham and uh, Burke Sackman in cortical slices, where they saw the back propagation action potential can modify the input by, the, by their different timing. So this uh, turned out to be a, a modified. This happens you know, more than 20 years ago. The, uh, the half learning rule should be better described in terms of timing of the spikes. You can have uh, correlated activity that modify the synapse, give the LTP pre-synaptic fire before post-synaptic. You have reversed the order, you get LTD. Right? This is well known. Now, uh, that there's a window, specific window for LTP and LTD depends on the cell type. And uh, this is the SD STDP. Now, STDP is very interesting because they now give you a an, an way of storing memory in a time-dependent manner. A, in a sequence, memory could be possibly uh, stored in this, in this uh, circuit. For example, if we uh, look at the, uh, uh, a thought experiment, now we have a, a, a randomly connected neural net uh, with a group of neurons connected to the next group, and they're all randomly connected. If we now give uh, a, uh, a, uh, sequence activation, that you fire the neuron in a sequence, called so-called synfile chain you heard last night, uh, the, the neuron, After this uh, con uh, continuous repetitive sequence activation, uh, you will have asymmetric uh, network where the downstream synapses are all potentiated, where the upstream synapses are all depressed by the spike time independent plasticity. Right? Once you create this situation, you can do another thought experiment that says we activate only the beginning uh, group of neuron. You, you would trigger uh, the uh, sequence firing. Right? If, if you have a, already have an asymmetric circuit. So you can re, uh, 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 record the memory, uh, the sequence uh, memory of the, uh, of the uh, this, uh, original stimulus. Right? So you have a storage mechanism for sequence memory and a retrieval mechanism. Now, uh, can you demonstrate this? So one way to do this is uh, look at it. We can uh, create um, a moving ball across the visual uh, field of a mice and with a, a multi-electro recording from the brain that uh, recorded uh, the uh, response uh, that, uh, of, the, uh, of the neurons which, uh, whose receptive field cover the, the path of your stimulus. So now we, if we uh, uh, produce a sweep, uh, sweeping stimulus across this receptive field of these electrodes, you will find that after repetitive training, you would expect some sort of storage, uh, sequence storage is stored in the intracortical connections uh, among these cortical neurons. Now, if that's the case, you should be able to recall that by giving only initial stimulus, right? flashing at the beginning or flashing at the end. You compare the flashing at both sides and you ask which is, uh, is more likely to create sequence firing. In, in one direction, in the direction where you train the, the circuit. Well, the answer is uh, there indeed. You, you have a sequence firing. Before training, uh, flashing at the beginning uh, didn't give you any sequence firing. Uh, but during conditioning, you get a very nice sequence firing of all these 16 electrodes recording the spiking. Now, you, after conditioning, you do flashing at the beginning, 
Now, in many cases, you start see a trained uh, uh, sequence firing, right? So, so the, the by doing uh, analysis of correlations, you you'll find that anesthetized mice or rat or well, weak rat all show this uh, enhanced sequence firing in the trend direction. Now, interestingly, in the, in the awake among, uh, rats, in awake rats, the storage of memory uh, is very shortened. It, it, uh, it decays within a couple of minutes. Now, this brings up another point. How do you store a stable memory in the brain? A few years uh, uh, earlier, we uh, studied LTP and LTD. We found that if you uh, produce LTP with the theta boost stimulation, this is actually the in vivo experiment in the retinal tactile synapse. Now you can create a rapid uh, a LTP, but if you now allow the, the recording electrode to go into current clamp, which the, the, the cellular recording can spike now, the LTP uh, decays with time. Now if you uh, do another uh, uh, stimulus, uh, high frequency stimulus, you can create a, a LTP if you record in a, in a voltage climb, it's stable. So uh, spontaneous spiking is doing something to LTP. That's a spontaneous spike is very active in an uh, active brain uh, uh, without any task. There will be spontaneous spiking. So mass learning are not stable if we allow spontaneous activity to go on. However, if you do the same amount of stimulus, uh, TBS stimulus, split it into three groups, 20 minutes, 20 uh, uh, ap uh, three episodes of 20 uh, stimulus each time. Now, even if you have a spontaneous activity going on, the, it becomes stable. Now, the spaced stimulation gives you stable uh, uh, LTP. In fact, there's optimal stimulus, uh, optimal interval for this spacing to create uh, stable LTP. If you have a longer intervals, even you have the same number of stimulus, you have no, no LTP can survive, right? So, there's, so the transition from an unstable short-term, let's say short-term LTP into a long-term LTP really depends on the pattern of the stimulation. Um, well, now, now again, that's, uh, finally let's get into uh, uh, the network. I don't have to talk much about uh, networks, uh, the artificial neural network, one of the major advance by Hartfield Network in the early 80s is to introduce of half learning rule that so that the memory can be stored within the network, right? And there's another big advance, the back propagation uh, algorithm, which the, the error signals used to tune the synaptic wave. There's again a plasticity idea that you can change the wave. Now, I remember the sensation in the late 80s where uh, uh, Terry was showing this to neuroscientist community about net talk. A, a network can learn to speak. Uh, it's really amazing. Right? The people in neuroscience say, well, that's much, much more effective than we can learn uh, than the human brain. In fact, this excitement has triggered uh, a comment by Francis Quick. He said that this excitement uh, suggests that maybe the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the neural net, uh, new algorithm, maybe promise a fresh approach to the understanding of computational property of the brain. However, now the back algorithm doesn't seem to be very realistic uh, because he said that in the, uh, uh, it's extremely difficult to see that how these signals coming out from out output can be propagated back to the input. I mean, we know the, the signals going from input to output, not the other way around. So he's unrealistic. Uh, Backpack unrealistic biologically. Now this comment stuck in my mind. Uh, well, a few years later, we uh, had a, a culture network uh, formed in culture. Now Rico Fitzsimmons was doing postdoc in the lab. He said, "Well, wh what can we do with this nice multi-electrode patch recording from culture?" Said, well, oh, well, let's look at it. Francis Quick, uh, the, the comment: Can we create uh, a synaptic modification between two cells uh, at the output? and see if we can, uh, that affects the input from another cell to the same cell, whether there's a back spread of some sort of signal from the output to input, right? Uh, nobody has looked at this. Nobody would uh, actually want to look at this uh, uh, because everybody thinks that LTP is synapse specific. So, so uh, but we did it. Uh, the experiment, in fact, works very nicely. Now, we use the same uh, half-field 
present, uh, way of presenting this circuit. With four neurons, you have 16 connections. Nine of them are actually functional. Now, if you create a LTP in one of the synapses, you find that LTP can be found in th three other synapses. Not in everyone. There's actually a very selective spread of the LTP. Uh, uh, this is a LTP to the presynaptic input of the cell that created the LTP. And in fact, after a lot of experiment, we found that there's an extensive back and lateral propagation of LTP and LTD. No, absolutely no forward propagation, right? So you create the LTP here, uh, up or down regulation. The input to the dendrite will up or down regulate in the same way within minutes, tens of minutes. Right? There's a signal, it's not an electrical signal, it's an intracellular signal depending on the uh, active transport of signals, pick up at the terminal, goes to the synapse. Now, this is, what does this mean uh, to, this, uh, to the uh, natural circuit? If the output is correct, so then the circuit might want to say, well, the input that created the output should be also correct. We, we need to strengthen it. So if, if LTP is created output, we might as well turn up the input. Uh, if the opposite is true, you have LTD on the output, if the LTD represents bad signal, a bad output, then the, the input should also be tuned down. So that's, that, that's what would be a natural way of modifying the synapse, right? And so we published this paper. Um, this paper first appeared as a propagation of uh, synaptic depression in a simple natural network. Now this paper broke two records. The first record is that it's uh, as far as I know, uh, longest nature article, 10 page article for, uh, for, many, for many years. Now that's the first record, right? The second record, this is the uh, nature article, as I know, the least cited nature article <laughs> uh, uh, in the field. Now the reason is clear, the biologist doesn't know what to do with it, about this. And the AI community where this was inspired never reads biology paper. So nobody uh, cares. Uh, <laughs> no, but but finally, uh, a few a few words. Finally, uh, we have we are now implementing back you now this this uh, AI inspired neuroscience. It's now back to inspire AI. We have uh, collaborators in Institute of Automation in Beijing, trying to instigate biological backdrop into the uh, artificial neural net. See if like helps, um, maybe some sort of some form of unsupervised learning. Anyway, last few words. Uh, I would like to uh, say the, for the, uh, there are a lot of things we learn in cellular physiology that might be useful for designing new uh, brain uh, machine learning algorithms. For example, the diversity of neuron type, we haven't talked about it. The different uh, uh, excitatory inhibitory synapse, there are cell type specific short and long term uh, plasticity. There's a neural modulator neuron, another type of neuron that have a diffuse or local modulation of the synapse of neurons. These are not incorporated at this moment. Mostly uh, the uh, artificial neuron is too simple. There's also ex uh, very useful feed for feed lateral back feedback connections, which is not, not uh, fully Im implemented. There's also this synaptic delay, which is important. Every transmission has a delay. Condu conduction of the signal has a delay. That's not incorporated. There's the uh, most important is what the main topic today is synaptic plasticity. We, we always talk about plasticity, changing the weight. Changing the weight is the function of plasticity. We never talk about structural plasticity. That is the uh, formation and illumination of synapse. Right? That's, a, that's an important aspect. Propagation of plasticity that I just mentioned. Uh, LTP, LTD, back propagation, lateral propagation, storage of memory, we never talked about it. There's the memory storage, distributed memory, but there's also the, the retrieval problem, and it's uh, within the five, and it's also important decay. Now, how do you stabilize the memory, uh, prevent the decay? How do you transit from short to long-term memory, a regular repetition, things like that? Reinforcement learning in neuroscience is, is not the same thing as what you, uh, the, the machine uh, learning field. It involves neuromodulated action that modify the rules of plasticity. Right? Uh, there, there's a very specific action of neuromodulator. So, uh, last slide. Uh, Half cell assembly uh, hypothesis. 
integration of multimodal information by correlated spiking. I, I'll stop here because I'm, I'm sure the oscillation will be a topic by Terry very soon. And also spiking. There's not enough attention given to spiking neural network because spike is so important in neuroscience, in, in, neuroscience, in, in, in nervous system. It, it codes the frequency, codes the timing, everything. So I think that much more push has to be done in spike, spike neural network. Sorry, I, I okay. took my time. Thank you. We have time for some questions. There's one here. Um, hi, great talk. So can you elaborate on a little bit? So you talk about function, uh, you talk about plasticity at the level of structure and at the level of synapses. So can you elaborate on how these map to different function of learning, presumably like learning for different tasks or like different time scale? Well, I think the uh, structural modification probably associated with really memory that you have to keep for a long time, long term. It's more, much more stable structure than, much stable modification than functional modification, right? So when you transit from a short term memory or a short LTP into a, a persistent LTP, you go through a structure. And, and that would involve modification that I will talk about, forming of new synapse or eliminate of synapse if you have a persistent LTP. Now, you're monopolizing the mic a little bit. So if there's someone else, let's, let's go to them first. There's one over there. Why don't we just transfer that over? Thank you. We just want to let some of the younger people chime oh. in as long as they're uh, I, I wonder whether the synapses that are clustered together uh, will be more stable uh, in the sense that they have lower uh, turnover rate. Or, or in the, ah, uh, when, when you're measuring the baseline right. turnover so rate. So th that's the aspect I haven't talked about it. So if one synapse gets, uh, gets potentiated, what happened to the adjacent synapse? Well, whether they do it in clusters. Uh, what's the lateral uh, uh, modification? This is a very interesting area I don't have time to talk about. It also associated with the spread of LTP or LTD. We found that, uh, that LTP cannot spread postsynaptically, but LTD can spread postsynaptically. Right? There, there are a lot of uh, interesting. So I, I, I mean, uh, like when you, m when you are measuring a baseline synaptic turnover rate, did you find the relationship between the uh, interspine distance and the layer stability, layer turnover rate? Uh, no, we haven't, uh, no this, uh, we haven't done the quantitative uh, measurements on that. Right, it's an interesting thing. How far the, the spine uh, distance relates to the turnover rate. I mean, there's a conservation of energy, conservation of material, right? So if you locally, you create a lot of LTP, a lot of growth, you would, you would think that the uh, adjacent spine will not have the ability to do it or be deprived of the ability to grow. Uh, so there's an interesting thing in that area. Okay. One more way in the back. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question about the back and lateral propagation of LTP and LTD. To what extent is the back, uh, to what extent is the uh, extension uh, backward and lateral words of LTP and LTD specific? Yes, uh, it's specific to the same cell that created LTP and LTD. It, the, the, the back propagation also back to these, uh, or the own, own synapse, own input. They also spread to the laterally to the output of the presynaptic neuron. It's very specific. Uh, and the, the spread to the output of the same neuron only if the postsynaptic cell is the same cell type. If you have an inhibitory neuron as a postsynaptic, that spread doesn't occur. So that I think they, uh, now this was all uh, done in, in cultural studies. So I, you know, I could be, uh, uh, you will also, first of all, the, the initial finding was in culture but the later confirmation was in retinal tactile synapse. So you can, that's what one way, only uh, way of going back to retina is back to the optic uh, nerve, right? So if you create the optical LTP and LTD in the output of the optical nerve, it actually back propagation to these ganglion cells, only for those ganglion cells that receive bipolar input. Those bipolar input will be modified, not adjacent ganglion cell, right? So it's a, it's a very sp cell specific. Thank you again. Thank you.